Hey guys, well, it is time for me to upgrade my electronics workbench uh, tabletop here. Uh, this table right here was uh, something that I went from job site to job site when I was still a general contractor. It was just a flat work surface for us to put drywall tools and carpentry stuff on. And, uh, you know, it was uh, just kind of, I wouldn't say cobbled together, but uh, it was just a cheap table that was uh, somewhat disposable. And I spent the last five years in my shop. Uh, I do a lot of my electronic stuff on it, and an OSB top is really not ideal for any kind of precision work. I mean, it's it's rough and, you know, it collects dirt and all that kind of stuff. So I needed some kind of hard countertop. Uh, this is what I came up with. I think it came out looking really good. So I'm going to show you guys how I did it. Now, before we get going on this video, I wanted to touch just a little bit on safety. I'm going to be working with high voltage um, between 15 and 20 kilovolts. Uh, it's definitely a potentially a lethal voltage. And I'm actually aware of people that have attempted to do what uh, Lichtenberg figure burning with high voltage and have died. Uh, now, I'm not going to say don't try this at home. Uh, all sorts of activities carry risk. I mean, it, you could be riding a motorcycle down the road and just a momentary lapse in judgment could re result in death. You know, I'm a pilot. I fly airplanes. Same thing there. A momentary mistake could cause death. Uh, it's no different with this right here. Uh, using uh, high voltage to burn wood, you know, a momentary lapse in judgment or a mistake can cause death. So keep that in mind. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to say don't try this at home. No, in fact, do try it at home, but uh, just be aware that you need to educate yourself on proper electrical safety beforehand. And if you don't feel like you can do it safely, then just don't. Um, electrical safety is something that I used to teach back when I was in the military. Uh, I've worked with high voltage my entire life. I'm not saying that I'm an expert or the, the most qualified person out there, but I definitely possess the equipment and the knowledge and skill to be able to do it safely. Uh, if you guys are going to try this, be aware that uh, using high voltage to do anything carries a lot of risks with it, and uh, just a, a momentary lapse in judgment or, or lack of understanding can uh, definitely result in injury or death. You can kind of see this wet area that I've painted on the wood here. Uh, this is with the uh, baking soda and water mixture. And the intent isn't to get a, uh, a burn that goes directly here. Uh, this is basically just to get the current flowing. It's still going to branch out as it works its way across there. Uh, the, the solution is just basically, like I said, to get the current flowing in the first place. So we kind of get an arc working across there. It's a little bit of a slow process. I've probably got a couple hours into this so far, but uh, it's coming out really good. And, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's going to look awesome once it's cast in the epoxy resin. And we're about 30 seconds in here. And you can see we can get some kind of spontaneous burning occurring right in the middle of the current path. So. All right, everyone's clear. Plug this back in. Turn her back on. So while I've got this burning here, I'll talk just a little bit about my power supply. Basically, I've got a 120 volt Variac right here, which has the ability to produce about um, 160 volts. When it's turned all the way up, that's what it outputs. Um, let's go into a 15 kilovolt neon sign transformer. This is a 40 milliamp ballast. 
on the secondary side, so it can not put out any more than 40 milliamps. Um, I hesitate to call it safe, but it's definitely safer than the microwave oven transformer design. So a microwave oven transformer would be at a, a lower voltage. Uh, I mean, depending on how you're driving the primary, maybe six, 7,000 volts at best. Uh, but it's essentially, it's not ballasted, so it's uh, almost unlimited current. And so the microwave oven transformers are uh, uh, certainly a more dangerous method of, of doing these Lichtenberg figures than a ballasted neon sign transformer is. Definitely wouldn't want to touch this, but if I did, I'd have a shot at surviving uh, with a microwave oven transformer. Uh, those, are, those are just super dangerous. So this whole sheet of plywood, the sawhorses, uh, basically everything you know, uh, in contact with this piece of wood right here should be considered live. Um, definitely don't want to touch it. 15 kilovolts is nothing to mess with. Almost there. All right, we're done with this one. All right, we'll let this thing cool down and move on to the next one. Well, I've got this piece of Luan mounted to my workbench here. Before I go a whole lot further, I did want to set a couple of expectations. Um, this isn't, this project wasn't meant to be some, you know, high quality showpiece or something like that. Uh, this bench is something that we used to take from job site to job site when I was still a general contractor. Um, you know, it was meant to be inexpensive, durable, and disposable. It's just got an OSB, half-inch OSB top to it. It's made out of two by six framing lumber and it has OSB gussets on the end. It is a cheap, disposable bench. However, uh, it's served as my electronic, electronics workbench for years and years. And, uh, you know, it's functional. Really, the only issue with it was the OSB countertop. That's not well suited to doing electronics. And so I had considered putting some other kind of countertop on it, but, this piece of Luan was cheap, and I figured uh, this is a good opportunity to learn something about the, uh, epoxy. I've never used that, uh, you know, on a large-scale project like this. So, you know, worst case is I end up with uh, kind of a, a crappy-looking countertop, but something that's still functional, uh, and I learned something. Best case scenario is I end up with something that looks really good and is functional, and I learned something. <laughs> Either way, you know, I've only spent just over a hundred bucks on this whole project, so it hasn't been particularly expensive, and uh, probably the most valuable part is I'm gonna take away a little bit of experience from it that'll help me on the next project. So, with that being said, I'm going to uh, fire up the miter saw and make a uh, MDF wrap that wraps around the perimeter of this here, and I'll caulk it, and then we'll start pouring some epoxy in there. I do have a couple of concerns. Um, you know, I've done my best with the vacuum and my air nozzle to get all the loose pieces of carbon out of here. Uh, it's possible that I didn't get them all and maybe we'll end up with some that float up in the epoxy. If that happens, there's not gonna be a whole lot I can do about it. The other thing I'm curious about is, you know, I have this fastened down pretty good, but it is burned all the way through and I'm, I'm curious how much epoxy I'm gonna lose underneath uh, this area right here. So uh, again, like I said, I'll learn something either way. Well, let's get to it. I shimmed this table as level as I could. I got a couple shims under the feet, uh, but the table surface underneath this was not perfectly flat. It kind of had some waivers and stuff in it. And so obviously that, that translates through to this Luan. So I was careful to build this exterior frame level. So this is level, but the tabletop kind of has these waves and stuff in it. Now, I ran a straight edge over the top of it, and I have more than a quarter inch of clearance everywhere, so no matter what, I'll be able to pour at least a quarter inch thickness of resin over the top of this. Um, I have not yet caulked these corners yet. One of my concerns is some of these are burned all the way through here. I don't have this table in any way sealed to the surface below it, so I think I am going to end up with some epoxy that ends up running a little ways underneath here. I'm fine with that. I don't know how far it's going to go. Hopefully it won't leak out the, you know, make it all the way to the edges and leak out. So my plan is once the epoxy is uh, fully cured, I'm just going to run a router bit around the edge to follow the surface of the epoxy. And then I'll uh, round everything off, sand it and repaint it. So time to get these things caulked up and then we'll, uh, we'll mix up some epoxy and we'll start by pouring in these low areas and uh, see what happens. My first small pour is done here. I didn't set up the camera for any of it, but basically I just uh, poured along each one of the burn traces. And the whole idea is to make sure that the 
wood is sealed up enough that I don't end up with uh, all my epoxy going down through the uh, through the cracks. And I actually have that issue in a couple spots here. Um, and like right along here, it basically it drained all the way down through. So I'm going to need to re-pour that. Uh, same with this little spot right here. Uh, same with right along here. Another one right there. And then that one over there as well. But actually all the rest of these sealed up pretty nicely. So uh, I'm going to mix up another, uh, another batch right here. And we'll pour in some of these problem areas again. And I'm just going to continue to do that until the... Uh, until it basically seals up and that uh, and the epoxy doesn't run down through those holes. And once it does, I'll mix up a big batch and then we'll basically just uh, go over the top of everything. So, time to mix up another one. Let's uh, fire up the mixer. The instructions say to pour the curing agent first. I do have the furnace going in the shop here and I've got it warmed up to, it's a, it's a cold night. So I probably don't have it warmed up quite as much as I'd like. I think we're at about 71 degrees in here right now. And I think the instructions call ideally for 75, but this is about as good as I can get out here during, this, uh, during the winter months here. And uh, around five minutes of mixing. Got a few air bubbles in there, but I'm not too concerned about that. I should be able to take those out with my heat gun once I've uh, once I've laid this down. So um, yeah, we're just gonna fill in the gaps here where I've noticed that uh, the epoxy's run through the table. Try to limit how much I'm pouring on here, but. And it's been about five hours since I poured that last batch. So it says uh, I need to allow that much time for the uh, epoxy to cure in between coats. And it's basically just tacky right now, the previous coat is. And again, I'm just basically using this as a, like a seal coat to deal with any of the spots that might have actually burned through when I was uh, doing my initial burning here. We've had these setting up for a while. I got a few bubbles to deal with. Not sure how well you can see that one right there. Another one right there. And we'll hit these with the heat gun. And a bunch of little microscopic bubbles in there too that are from the uh, from the mixing process. A little hard to see those on the camera, but the heat gun does just a phenomenal job. Pulls all those bubbles right out of there and end up with just this nice crystal clear finish. Well, it's the following morning, about six hours after I poured this. Uh, 
last layer and everything is looking really good. Um, there's a couple areas where I can tell some of the epoxy dipped down a little bit, uh, probably a little bit more flowed underneath the plywood, but uh, all of those areas are now fully encapsulated. So when I pour my next layer, uh, it's just gonna fill in those little dips. Uh, see like right here is one of them. It's just gonna fill in those little dips and no more will flow through the, uh, through the areas that are completely burned through. So uh, let's mix up our remaining epoxy and pour it in place. Well, the pour is done and I definitely ended up with a pretty even surface here. Actually, I'd say things came out better than I expected them to. I do have some aeration in there, some bubbles. Not sure how well that shows up, but we're going to take care of those right now with the heat gun. Let's see if I can show how well this heat gun works to take these bubbles out of here. Pretty amazing, the bubbles kind of rise to the surface, and then uh, as the heat gun goes over, the bubbles basically expand and pop right on the surface of the epoxy. That's really neat, it almost kind of looks milky colored before the heat gun runs over, and then once it's done, it's just like a crystal clear finish. Well, it's been about 36 hours and uh, yeah, I'm really happy with this table. It's, uh, you know, it's not fully cured yet, obviously, but the surface is solid, it's not tacky anymore. Uh, I'm gonna turn the furnace down in my shop so I don't keep burning through my waste oil here, but uh, yeah, it is uh, um, f far and above better than I expected. Now, there are a few issues with it, and again, I use cheap materials here, and, and the whole point was to teach me, uh, you know, about how to do epoxy casting here, because I've never really done anything this large before. So let me point a few of those issues out. And it's a little difficult for the camera to show it, but if I kind of get move up and down here and you look across the surface, you can see those warbles in the sheen are where I poured epoxy in these burn traces uh, the first during the first and the second pours. Now, the reason I did that was to seal these up to make sure I didn't have epoxy running down underneath the table. Uh, and so that was necessary. However, when I poured it, I allowed it to spill over the edges. Now I thought that wouldn't be a problem because I was pouring another thick pour over the top of it, but um, for reasons I'm not entirely sure of just yet, um, something probably to do with surface tension and uh, adhesion and things like that. Um, this epoxy didn't really fill the gaps in between. It actually ended up thicker where I poured previously. Um, so pouring the epoxy in here was necessary and it was the correct thing to do. However, in the future, I'll be careful to only, uh, I'll try to keep the epoxy level at or below the surrounding surface. And having done that, um, if I had done that, I wouldn't have the same issues that I'm having now with the, uh, you know, with the little tiny warbles in there. And again, um, you know, this is, uh, that's okay, this is a, a workbench, it's going to get scratched up and all that kind of stuff. I could correct that. I think if I uh, mixed up another two gallons and poured another tenth of an inch up here over the whole table again, I think that it would level everything out. But I see no reason to spend 
another 120 bucks on more epoxy here when, again, this is just a, a work table. Hey, another flaw that you'll see here, and again, I don't know how easy it is to point out. I've got a pretty bad one right there. Um, these are not bubbles. What they are is, uh, you know, this is cheap Luan plywood. What they are is like little grains of wood that have basically kind of floated up off the surface. They're still attached to the plywood, but they kind of just floated up and uh, touched the surface of the epoxy. And I've got, you know, probably 20 or 30 of these throughout the table. There's actually, uh, if I run my hand over it, I can kind of feel a few. There's several of them right here. A little difficult to see in the lighting we have here. I think I could fix that with some like uh, thousand grit sandpaper and some polish. Um, but again, workbench. So um, that has a lot to do with the cheap material that I used here. This Luan plywood's kind of bottom drawer stuff. So, um, you know, if I used some fur plywood or something with a more consistent surface, that wouldn't have been an issue. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that I learned from this pour. All right, and one more issue that uh, I definitely caused here. Um, this sheet of plywood is only a quarter inch thick, so it's, you know, just a little tiny thin piece of plywood. So it's really difficult to caulk on the edge of it when I put this MDF wrap around here. So uh, when I built the frame around here, I ran silicone right along the edge right here, and then just basically wiped it out with my finger. Uh, because this pour was so thin, the, uh, um, I'll try and show you here, the in some places, the epoxy did not run over this silicone caulk. It basically stopped right here before uh, reaching the edge. Now, if I was using a different material that had, you know, it was thicker and I could caulk to the side of it, the surface of the side of it, this wouldn't have been a problem. I don't really know. Uh, there, there's probably some things that I could have done to do better on this one, but uh, I anticipated that that might be an issue here. It's probably a little worse than I thought it was going to be, but. Uh, um, not a whole lot I can do to fix that at this point, again, unless I, you know, uh, pour another two or three gallons of epoxy on here and raise it another eighth of an inch or so. Probably the worst spots right down here. But I'm going to keep going back to the same thing I keep saying, and uh, you know, this is just a workbench in my shop and it's going to get scratched up and damaged anyway. And uh, I don't intend to pour any more epoxy on this unless it's in the future to repair some damage to the surface. So what's next? I've got a router with a guide roller that I will run around the perimeter of this and that will bring this surface of this face frame down level uh, flush with the surface of this uh, epoxy right here. And so uh, that way I'll end up with a nice surface down flush here without this lip. Uh, I built this lip here because the table has a lot of, uh, you know, waves and things like that in it. The surface isn't perfectly flat. So I didn't really know how much epoxy I was going to have to pour here to, to bring that up. And, and so that, that, that's in, intentional. Uh, bringing this down flush was something I knew I was going to have to do when this was all over. So yeah, I'll, I'll bring this down flush. I will do the same thing on the corners right here. Uh, I'll get some wood filler in the cracks and then over the top of the fasteners. And then I'll run a, a quarter round bit on the corners to radius the corners, uh, sand the whole thing down and paint it. Yeah, and once I'm done with that face frame, uh, the workbench will be finished. I can stack all my junk back on here and pile up my drone parts and my Tesla coils and uh, all my electronics and everything. So as I mentioned before, this project isn't designed to be like a showpiece. I'm not selling this to anyone. The main purpose of this right here was to teach me a little bit about epoxy casting. And, and the reason is I have some other projects planned that are coming up and I didn't want to learn on those because I'm going to be using far more expensive materials. I wanted to learn on this one, teach myself a little bit about, uh, you know, pitfalls and limitations using the epoxy and then use that information to do a better job on the upcoming projects. Now stay tuned because in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be doing a similar project on a coffee table butcher block countertop that, uh, it's a coffee table my son and I built. It's in our rec room right now. It's actually a really nice industrial looking piece. Uh, but the top's a butcher block and it's just, uh, you know, we coated it in polyurethane. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do Lichtenberg traces in it, similar to these. So we'll burn these uh, surfaces into the surface of the butcher block. And then what we'll do is drill around 600 tiny holes, 0 0.03 inches up from the backside and we'll uh, run fiber optic cables up into those uh, into those holes along the burn traces. Uh, then we'll trim those fiber optic cables flush, cast the whole thing in epoxy, 
and uh, attach the fiber optic cable bundle to a light driver, a light source underneath the table. So um, you won't actually be able to see them or anything, but when we power it up, these traces will actually light up and I'll be able to adjust the colors and, and make them twinkle and all that kind of stuff. So well, I've never done anything quite like that before, but I think it's gonna look really cool. I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about it, so is my son. So I'll be sure to set up the camera and have you guys follow along as we attempt that project. And uh, yeah, with any luck, we'll have a really cool, like, uh, you know, lit Leichtenberg uh, figure countertop in our rec room. Well, guys, thanks for following along on this epoxy casting project here. Uh, hopefully you find the mistakes that I made educational. Uh, maybe it'll inspire you guys to try a project like this, and hopefully you won't make the same mistakes that I did. Thanks again for watching, and uh, we'll see you later.